Welcome back to the lab guys. Today I'm going to be going over FreeNAS, kind of just a basic introduction, what it is and how it can help you in your lab. So stick around. All right, guys. So what is FreeNAS? An introduction to FreeNAS. So FreeNAS is kind of a software defined storage actually sorry it is software defined storage basically what happens is it uses the hardware that you give to it which we'll go over all the hardware requirements and kind of the way that it works but it uses all the hardware into that it's given and as an operating system it creates kind of a defined storage array or allows you to create a defined storage to present to guests via you know apple storage smb uh, i mean let me open up over here on the left hand side there's so many different things when you go into sharing i mean you got apple you got unix web dev windows block iSCSI, which is going to be the main one i'm focusing on today the fact that it does iSCSI is a big deal because that allows it to be used for shared storage inside of a lab so in my case i have five hosts my five hosts here i'll show you over here i have five hosts and these five hosts all use data stores they have data stores as you see, I've got a bunch of data stores, bunch, bunch, bunch of data stores. All these data stores are all handled over here on FreeNAS. Every one of these, if I go in, there's an individual volume for every single server that gets mapped out to its own LUN, that gets mapped out over to the uh, host. And I actually have videos on that. I'll go ahead and link them up here or link them down below in the description. But I do have videos on how to map iSCSI and set up iSCSI on FreeNAS. And I was like, man, I don't have one on an introduction of FreeNAS and kind of what it is because I've had a lot of people ask me. I even have some people that I'm helping set up their labs. And I'm like, man, you should, we should really get you a FreeNAS server built. And they're kind of like, well, why? I, I thought I have a SAN. And I, I kind of explained to them why I actually prefer FreeNAS over, you know, using like maybe a DS3512 or some type of, you know, Synology or something. So that's what this video is about guys what we're getting into here i'm going to kind of go over why i prefer free nas over a san or anything like that um free nas to me and uh people may disagree with this is about the closest i feel like you can get to a nimble system pretty cheaply and for those of you that don't know what nimble is nimble was recently bought by hpe i believe earlier this year maybe the last two years can't remember exactly but Nimble storage is a fantastic, very flexible storage device. And it's actually not even really storage. They don't call it a SAN. It's actually a storage server. It's the same thing as what FreeNAS kind of is. Uh, or I should say FreeNAS is kind of like Nimble, you know, whichever way, whoever came first. Not worried about that. But FreeNAS is about the closest you're going to get to Nimble to, it, to me. And that's and Nimble is really a high-end enterprise storage device. And so FreeNAS is the fact that it's open source and it basically can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nimble is fantastic. I mean, I've got probably better throughput and better, uh, you know, accessibility than some of our smaller Nimble storages. And I mean, most of the stuff is all stuff that I've just thrown together that kind of hodgepodge and made. But Let's go ahead and get into the nitty gritty of FreeNAS and you know what it's all about. So what are some, you know, the, the things about FreeNAS? So whenever you're building a FreeNAS server, and I've been trying to talk to people about this, is you know, is a lot of people are like, well, do I need ECC RAM? You know, do I not? You know, how much CPU do I need? How much hard drives do I need? A RAID controller? What are some of the things? So let's get, you know, right into it. ECC. Yes, if you're gonna be using it a lot and it's gonna be in production, please use ECC. ZFS loves ECC RAM because what happens is it can use the RAM to go ahead and do its checksums and it can check its checksums which allows it to make sure that there's no issues and if there's an improper shutdown there's no chance of any blocks being written badly or any sectors having issues and it really helps prevent any data corruption and i, I don't want to see anybody posting you know after watching these videos getting a free night but i really hope you guys don't go on the, on there and be like i lost all my data and it's because improper shutdowns and not having enough ram or using ecc I know, i'm not saying you have to use ecc you, if you're just wanting to mess around with the lab and nothing's mission critical you don't have anything like tax documents you don't have anything that you're worried about that you're like my life depends on this you got family pictures things like that like you don't want your wife to kill you that's fine lab environment set up some ram throw it together have some fun there you go. Now, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, what about CPU? What do I need? It all depends on the amount of data. I mean, if you're not serving up large amounts of data, you don't have a bunch of VMs running. I mean, a lot of people can get away with an i3. Some people I've even seen them use Pies. It all depends what you're sharing. Now, with Block and iSCSI, I'd recommend probably trying to get like, you know, an i3 or an i5 or something like that or something with, you know, at least quad core. So that way you can go ahead and kind of handle the heavier loads, especially if you're going to be trying to run multiple VMs across it. Now, my system is definitely way over-spec'd. 
Um, reason being is because I didn't want to have to shut it down to keep upgrading it. I just wanted to be able to plug in drives and expand as I needed to. I have 128 gigs of uh, DDR3 ECC RAM and dual 5530s inside of this. And that's my, my system setup. And I can go over here to reporting. You can kind of see, let me show you guys. Oh, it won't let me go back because I just rebooted everything this weekend when I did that inventory. So as you can see, though, I mean, since then, there's not been much CPU usage. And I mean, the system load, too doesn't really spike that much and that's with you know it automatically v motioning and moving machines around because i do have drs and everything enabled on my stack so that's with that going on too all right now the next part how much ram is needed how, mu how much ram is needed for free nas now free nas you know it it can it can be pretty ram intensive that's kind of why i built my system with a lot of ram but it's not a hundred percent needed i mean you can get away with eight gigs and be pretty stable up to about 24 terabytes now i'm not saying that it's going to be fast i'm not saying it's going to be great but i'm just saying you could you could use eight gigs to get you probably through about 24 terabytes 16 gigs is like a minimum if you're going to try to get up about above that and if you're going to go past 100 terabytes, I'd recommend 32 gigs. But guys, like, even then, that's just the minimum side. I mean, that's just going to kind of keep you stable. If you really, really want that performance and things like that, it uses the RAM as cash. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I, I have so much RAM is that way. Right now, I don't have SSDs. There is a planned future for me to uh, go ahead and install SSDs and get some things rearranged. So that way I can get that other cache and be able to use, you know, SSD cache. But for now, I mean, it actually uses the RAM to go ahead and cache a lot of this data of what's used so that way it knows where things are at. And that's where ECC RAM comes in important because it does error checking. So it's kind of, you know, your toss up. I, I, th there's always that term thrown around. A lot of people say one gig of RAM per one terabyte of hard drive space, but it's kind of your own discretion. I'm not saying that, that I, I follow that rule. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, but I follow that rule. I do one gig of RAM per one terabyte. I do eight gigs at least for the operating system. So, I mean, when you get to that point, let's say you got eight gigs for the operating system. Let's say you got 24 terabytes. So you've got 24 plus eight. So you need only 32 gigs of RAM. To me, that's pretty acceptable for a 24 terabyte storage array, iSCSI block. You know, that's that's fantastic. So that's that's what I would probably look at. That's what you need to be looking at for RAM and CPU. Now, the next part, guys, I want to get into is the storage adapters. Now, uh, I'm not going to I can't stress this enough. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I just got to get through and I was trying to explain to some coworkers is it ZFS loves to see the drives directly. It likes it directly connected, whether you're using HPA or whatever you need to use in a SAS expander in your server, whatever you got going on, ZFS loves when it can just have and touch the drives and get all touchy feely with them. You know, it's, I know it's weird, but it, it's true because when ZFS can do that, it can more properly kind of manage the drives, the blocks, the sectors and everything like that, because there's nothing, there's no middleman. When you throw in a RAID controller in there, even if you put all the drives to RAID 0, that RAID controller is ultimately still controlling how the you know blocks are written, where they're written on the drive. FreeNAS has no idea about that because RAID controller is controlling it. It's handed off to another device. Now, what you always want to try to do with the ZFS is remove that middleman device. Try to go ahead and get everything direct connected just like it. So if I go over here to storage right now and I go to view disk, here are my disks right now. All right. So that allows me to basically see that all these and all these are direct connected. So the whole point being is that you want to make sure ZFS is using JBOD. What is JBOD? Just a bunch of disk, which means that everything should be direct connected to the motherboard as best as you can, whether you're using, you know, JBOD mechanics or using just SATA cords or, you know, just please stay away from a RAID card because it can cause issues later down the line. Now, I'm not saying you can't use one. You know, some people, they want to mess with FreeNAS. They want to see how it works. They kind of want to get used to the interface. I do have some people that have that. You know what? That's fine. Go ahead and build your RAID out. Just realize, don't put anything mission critical on there. Don't. It's the same with the ECC RAM thing. You know, don't sit there and be like, I'm going to put all my pictures and I'm going to, you know, look at wife. We can do all this stuff. And then all you lose it all. And then she's like, where's my wedding photos and all this stuff. And then you're screwed because used RAID and you didn't do JBOD, you didn't let it see the you know device fully. So once again, I'm going to stress, guys, make sure you allow ZFS to see all of the drive completely. FreeNAS loves when it can just see everything and it can touch everything. All right. Now, the last one I get last, I, I ask it, asked a lot, sorry, that I kind of want to get into is virtualization versus bare bone. Now, the thing is, is 
I'd stress, I, I mean, I understand some people like to virtualize, but please, if you're going to make it your main storage server, if you're going to make it feed everything, please make it bare metal. I, like, that's, I can't stress that enough. You know, I know I've been stressing a lot of things in this video, but it, it needs to be bare metal if it's going to be your main storage system. Now, you can virtualize it. You can pass through all the drives. I've done that for some people. I've gone ahead and I've built a, fit, I've built a virtual host. All right, Matrix had plenty of RAM. I installed FreeNAS. I passed through all the drives to FreeNAS. I make FreeNAS set itself up. I then build a vSwitch for iSCSI. I connect you know, FreeNAS to that vSwitch, and then I allow the host itself to be connected to that vSwitch and allow itself to go ahead and map iSCSI from FreeNAS that FreeNAS is presenting. Now, it's totally possible. It's just not the best way to do it, and it's... You know, if, if the host crash, you never know what's going to happen to FreeNAS and things like that. So it's just a lot of... A lot of issues. Now, you can virtualize it if you want to learn it. You want to try to figure it out, or maybe you've got a small environment and you're just kind of playing around or you're not too worried about what's going on in it. Yeah, do it. Virtualize it. It's fantastic. It works great, but the thing is, is that it's not meant for it. So don't, you know, if you start having issues or little hiccups or, you know, things like that, it just don't get salty about it, man. <laughs> that's about all I can say. So, I mean, that's that's it, for guys, for my real quick kind of into free nas and my basic introduction i just kind of want to give an overview of what it is what are some of the things you need to look at when you're trying to deploy in your environment you know and just go ahead and i've got other videos of how to map iSCSI things like that watch those videos i don't want to get into all that right now but i did want to go ahead and just kind of do a simple introduction and kind of get that out there so you guys kind of could have an idea of what you needed to do to get your free nas system up and running that way you could go ahead and get shared storage and get it to where you've got multiple hosts in a cluster and you can vmotion machines between them all and do what you need to <laughs> all right now that we're done with that guys i'm done everybody merry christmas happy new year happy holidays whatever you do and always guys i'll see you in the lab <laughs>